Tennis, super excited to be here live with you answering your tennis questions. If you have any questions, be sure to throw them in the comments section below. Uh, let me give you one simple piece of advice. This is well known, so maybe this isn't so much uh, teaching you something new, but maybe it's reminding you of what maybe you had forgotten to use as your number one way to force an error. So depth is without a doubt the most important way. Uh, and if you just got on, thanks so much for joining me. Go ahead and push uh, or write hello in the comments section and tell me where you're from, by the way. Make sure you tell me where you are from. So depth. Depth is the number one way to force an error. I, there are three ways to win a point in singles and doubles, and I should just say tennis in general, there are three ways to win a point. You can hit a winner, you can wait for an unforced error, or you can force an error. So unforced errors and winners, eh, they're not really the best way. And thanks so much for joining me. We've got 25 people here, which is awesome. Only two likes. We got to get those likes to match the number of people in this live stream. Uh, so three ways to win a point. Hitting winners, it's risky, uh, especially in doubles. Hitting winners in doubles, so difficult to do because they've doubled the number of people, but they haven't doubled the size of the court. Uh, hello from Buffalo, New York. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here on. Um, so what we're looking for is how to actually force an error. Uh, you can sit here and wait for your opponent to miss with an unforced error. Stockholm, Sweden, amazing. But forcing an error, it's the most reliable way because it's safe right? You're not just like screaming a winner into the corner. Uh, and it's repeatable, right? We, it, it's, it's doable to lower your opponent's level of play. And of all the ways that you can force an error, the one that is the most effective is depth. The closer you can get the ball to land in your ground strokes, let's like, just say you're rallying back and forth. The closer you can get the ball to land to the back line, that's when you're going to see Cambridge. Amazing. Thanks so much. Uh, oh, I know who that is. <laughs> What's up, Andre? So you want the ball to get as close as you can as possible to the baseline. That is how you are going to force an error. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free, right? Oh, good. We got, we're up to eight likes. Let's see if we can. We got 26 people and only eight likes. Let's see if we can get those likes to be as close to the number of people as possible. Huntington Beach, thank you so much for being here. So how do we get the ball deep, right? It's one thing. What's up, David? Thank you so much. It's one thing to get the ball to land close to the baseline by understanding that. Like, okay, Ryan, that's what I should do. Well, how am I going to do that? You actually do it with height. So question for you, and I, I see some people in here. Question for you, what percentage of the time when you're, let's just say you're playing a singles match or you're just rallying with a friend, whatever. What percentage of the time do you aim a specific height over the net? I would love to get some of you to respond in the comment section. What percentage of the time do you aim to a very specific height? I'm not saying you hit your target. That's not what I'm asking. I'm not asking how often do you hit the target you have over the net. That's a completely different number. I'm just simply asking for all of you tennis players here, and you're here because you're a tennis player, what percentage of the time when you're hitting a backhand, do you have an exact, there you go, we got uh, not often, good, all right, good. Andre, yep, 0%. I, no, that's <laughs> Helen. How are you, Helen? Thanks for being here. Uh, almost never, 5%. Yep, yeah, this is what we, this, yeah, you aim for a landing point, yep. This is really what happens, right? People just don't think about the height over the net. Just understand something. The speed you hit the ball plus the spin you put on the ball, top spin, side spin, under spin, plus the height the ball passes over the net equals where your ball lands, right? So Andre was talking about, um, I think about a landing spot, right? So a landing spot where you want the ball to land, that's one of the two targets that you have as a tennis player. The idea, the idea here is there are two targets, the air target, gives you the court target. It would kind of be like, Andre, if I'm going to bake a chocolate cake, but I have no recipe to follow. I have what I want. I'm like, oh man, I could really go for some chocolate cake. Well, how do I make it? I'm like, I don't know. I have to go find the recipe. 
The recipe for the ball landing, the, the landing spot, Andre, the recipe is, or the math equation to get the answer of where it lands is the speed of your shot plus the spin you put on the ball plus the height over the net. That equals this. And if you, like a chocolate cake recipe, if you remove the flour or you don't put in the eggs or you don't even put in the cocoa or whatever, whatever the different, and I don't bake, so I don't even know what goes in a chocolate cake, to be honest. Um, but the idea is if you remove any of those ingredients, then you don't have a chocolate cake anymore, right? And remove any of them, you're like, oh, that's not gonna end up as a chocolate cake. It's the exact same thing. So you can't just have in your mind where you want the ball to land. You also have to think about the height that the ball is gonna pass over the net. If you have any questions, I feel like there was a question here. Best tips for coaching kids, mostly with timing. Hmm. If you could, uh, 22, uh, if you could be a little more specific what you mean by timing, coaching kids and timing. If you could just let me know what you mean by that. And uh, just be a little more, uh, you, you don't be afraid to kind of write a paragraph in your question. Uh, we got Nigeria here. This is awesome. This is really, really great. Super excited. <laughs> Timing with four hands. All right, so first off, um, what people typically do, and in, in kids, beginners, kids usually contact the ball too far out in front. They usually contact the ball too, out, too far out in front, which means if they're right-handed, the ball goes way to the left. So we have to get them to understand that the ball has to get later in their swing. One of the things you can do with that is to get them to turn their upper body more. Kids usually face forward too much, so the opponent can see their chest. And so one of the things we can do is to get them to turn the body more, and if they turn their body more, that means it takes longer for them to uncoil, so then it takes longer, which means the ball gets to come more to our side. You've got the idea of bounce and then hit. I'm not actually a huge fan of that because um, they tend to think bounce and then they swing. And that actually, I think, perpetuates the idea that they, they swing a little too early. Another thing you can do is teach them, I know this is almost against like what you hear, but teach them to hit the ball while it's falling. So what I've noticed is with juniors, especially new to the game, is that they tend to hit the ball very close to the peak, which means they're playing the ball very early or they'll run forward toward the ball. I would actually say, Teach them to move. This is so against what you're going to hear <laughs> from like USPTA and all the other places where you can learn that like about teaching, co teaching kids. But I would teach them to learn how to move back and hit the ball on the fall. Because what kids and beginners normally do is they see the ball coming to them and they run forward and they hit the ball too early. So I would rather teach them like I would do hand tossing and just have them maybe stand on the baseline, maybe put a drop down poly spot, like have them here. Let me see, yeah, you can see that. So I would put myself, like I'm the coach and I'm right here and I would feed a ball to them and I would say, hey, I want you to be back here to hit the ball. So I would hand toss a ball, make them move back and they have to hit the ball while it's falling. If they hit the ball while it's falling, make it a point for them. If they hit the ball on the rise or the peak, it's a point for the coach and say, hey, first one to 10 wins. Kids tend to be early. So we're talking about uh, improving timing. Well, that means what you're noticing is for kids, kids are mistiming the shot. And in my experience, they swing too early. So you have to let the, let the ball breathe a little bit, let the ball drop, let the ball, like give it some time. And so I would teach them to actually move back and let the ball fall. And if they do, reward them with the point. Just my experience. A question about forehand power. After my take back, when do I start my forward swing? I went to pull my elbow forward instead of my hand wrist. Do you know, do you know that or is it, is that method unusual? Yeah, you're talking about, yeah. All right, let's talk about the forehand. So you're at, your question is, uh, when do I start my forward swing? Yeah, um, you, you don't want to think of starting your forward swing. What you want to think of is um, uh, uh, clearing the non-hitting hand and that rotates the body and then the arm gets pulled through. Let me explain. So you don't want to think of it as the arm swinging like forward. You, you, it's not this, we're not swinging the arm forward. What you wanna do is take the racket back with both hands. So you wanna take the racket back with both hands and then as the racket is dropping, the left arm or the non-hitting arm is clearing. 
So we all know that we want to turn our hips, whether it's an open stance, we want this to occur, whether it's a neutral or closed stance, we want the rotation of the body and that pulls the arm through. But what people don't realize, and I watch coaches, you see coaches all over YouTube talking about hip rotation, but there's something that allows for the hip rotation to occur and it's the non-hitting hand clearing out of the way. I'll watch coaches teaching on YouTube and they have a student who's struggling turning their hips and the student's arm is like this, their non-hitting arm is like this. Now you can artificially get the student to turn their hips because they're so focused on it during the lesson and, and you'll see them go like this and all of a sudden they're facing forward. But when they go back into the wild and they get in their plane and fly back home after going to the coach, it's not gonna make a difference. You have to have, uh, from Plymouth in the UK, amazing, so amazing, thanks so much. So what you want is to clear this non-hitting hand. You wanna clear the non-hitting hand. So take the racket back with both hands and then all you do is as the racket's dropping, you clear your non-hitting hand. And then what happens is as you start clearing, then the arm comes through. So don't think of swinging your right arm or when does the swing come forward? It's you drop the racket as you clear the non-hitting hand. And what I mean by that is from the front, you'll see this. I turn and then I start clearing this non-hitting hand out of the way. You look at Djokovic when he hits a forehand, it looks like he's waving to the camera at contact. Clearing the non-hitting hand helps rotate the body because if you don't, then you end up hugging yourself. You'll notice there's a direct correlation. And if you're a coach, you know exactly what I'm about to say here. There's a direct correlation between the height of the non-hitting hand at contact and the level of the player. So if the, le if the student is a beginner, their non-hitting hand is down. If they're very advanced, their non-hitting hand is up. So as this hand gets higher, the level of the player gets higher. But you watch beginners and they often hit like this and they're kind of giving themselves a hug. If, if you've ever seen someone hit forehands and they look like they're hugging themselves, it's because their non-hitting hand is dropping. You want the non-hitting hand to go across and actually up and you want this. Now I'll always get the, 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 the Twitter warriors and the keyboard warriors <laughs> saying in the comment section, Ryan, the non-hitting hand waving, that's just a result of the hip, or of the shoulders and the hip rotation. But it's not, <laughs> because if it drops, then they can't make that move. So you have to actually make this move on purpose. And when you do that, and somebody's talking about when do you swing forward on the forehand, you don't think of it as swinging forward. You just begin dropping the racket as the non-hitting hand is clearing. See, look at this. I'm making this move as I'm doing this and I'm doing it simultaneously. So the racket and the non-hitting hand, my right hand and left hand, they go back together and then they separate. And then they come back together again. So the hands are together, then they separate, and then they hit. This move of, I'm trying to think of my elbow, I wouldn't worry about your elbow. I would worry about your body rotating and then the arm is just gonna drag through and get pulled through. Let's see what other questions. We should have a lot here. Unit turn, correct. I'm trying to hit a heavier rally ball that forced my opponent back. When I tried, I seemed to dip the ball into the net or way out, oops, sorry. Give me a second here. Or way out the back. Any tips I should be aiming to do? Yeah, Robert, um, focus on making sure that the racket goes from below your hand to above your hand. So focus on this occurring. That as you're hitting, the racket's below your hand to above your hand. If you can go below to above, but then catch high, you're gonna have the spin that you want, uh, but you're also gonna have the drive through the back of the ball. Where are the top and bottom flaps on the Top Spin Pro? Uh, I took them off. I taught a lesson this morning to a woman in South Korea and we were working on Top Spin serves. So I usually don't even have the flaps on. Um, if I'm doing like a, a, a bit in one of my YouTube videos for it. I put the flaps on so you can see how it like comes. And by the way, I have a broken string. You'll probably notice. Um, <laughs> my rackets are in the car. I forgot to bring them in. <laughs> um, so I'm just using a racket with a broken string. But uh, normally I just, I just leave it like this. That way I can take the arm off and I can show people spin, like top spin this way. I was having her practice top spin serves or just like, cause she had a top spin pro. 
and just making this move and she can practice this and understand how to go up the ball. So I usually just keep the flaps off. It takes like three seconds to put them on and off again. All right, let's see what we got here. Is it okay to not have a flat serve? Not only is it not okay, it is preferred. Don't hit flat serves. Loose flaps guide us to cut the diagonal path. Uh, they, you're right, they do. They do. I'm not saying you have to take them off the moment you get your topspin pro, but once you understand that, you can easily take off the paths or take off the, um, uh, the flaps. Uh, is it okay to not have a top spin, uh, uh, not have a flat serve? So what I teach is every serve is a spin serve. It's just some serves the ball spins faster and some spin some serves the ball spins slower. So as the the spin rate or RPM slows, the speed of the the serve increases. So it's just it's just like this. So more speed, less spin. More spin, less speed. Cool answer. I'll give it a go. Thanks. You got it. I have an Eastern grip. I'm not sure what that's in relationship to. Yeah, I got you. Yep. Uh, how much does the dominant eye, to me, JP Tennis, I, look, look. <laughs> My job is, to, think of me as a mechanic. Um, to me, there are such bigger fish to fry when it comes to, like, the whole reason all this dominant eye stuff, in my opinion, the whole reason the dominant eye stuff is super sexy right now is because of uh, Moratoglu. And it's just like, he keeps, like, focusing on it, focusing on it. When you see players who are hitting forehands and the racket's like this, and then they're swinging across like that, uh, dominant eye ain't helping you. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> so if you want to work on your dominant eye focus, where on the, you know, if you're, uh, left eye dominant, your head's like this, and your right eye dominant, your arm, your head's like this on a forehand to get the eye. You know, if you want to work on that, you're free to. But if you don't close your racket face on a forehand, you know, and you're rolling the racket as you hit the ball, it's going to make no difference at all. So there are people who, again, if I'm a mechanic for your car and your car is not working well, I can put an air fresher in, uh, air freshener in it, like the little tree air freshener to make your car smell great, like a brand new car. But if the if the if the engine's still not like it has no oil in the engine and the brakes are shot, it's not really going to perform any better. It's going to smell good, but it's not really going to perform any better. And that, to me, that's that's what the dominant eye stuff is. It's it's not actually addressing major issues. That's kind of like a fine tuning idea to really be able to see the ball well or, or whatever, but uh, the pine freshener, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I, I just, to me, uh, I, I, I think a lot of the, the people who talk about the eye dominance, uh, they're, they're lacking in, in substance in what can actually be taught to these students. Because I see these lessons and I'm looking at what is being taught to these students. And it's, it's, it's like giving a car wash to a car that has no engine. And it's like, well, it's nice and shiny, but I mean, it's not going to perform when it goes back onto the court or goes home. Um, uh, do serve and volley, serve and volley or sometimes do a two-step split step? Yes, they do. Depends on, uh, Rotical is a salesman with a good eye for talent. Yeah. Well, anybody's a good eye for talent. <laughs> I mean, he's being sent players and, you know, and so it's like, yeah, you're really talented, you know. Um, uh, what, one thing that Muratoglu is really strong with is experience in dealing with high-level players from the standpoint of mentality and match preparation. These are things that I wouldn't, you know, he, he'd run circles around me on match preparation and, and, and the focus and the, um, the way you prepare yourself the night before or the morning of you know, with Serena playing Halep, like, I have no experience in that. Uh, I mean, there's so few coaches who actually have experience in that. Um, but when it comes to the other side of it, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot lacking. Yeah, the, the two-step split step is, and somebody's asking, you know, I guarantee you somebody's like, wait, what is a two-step split step on a serve and volley? So when you serve and volley, you have to realize that it's not just the serve and the volley that you have to worry about. It's the split step as well. So when you watch players serve and volley and split step, they'll serve and then they don't just run forward to the net. That's not what happens. You need to split step and you need to split step just past 
the center of no man's land. So this is the very center of no man's land. You're going to split step just on the other side of it. That might be one step for you. I'm sorry. That might be two steps for you. That might be three steps. If your opponent is standing back like Medvedev <laughs> with their back up against the back fence, um, then, you know, then, you know, obviously you'll be able to have more steps in and you might even get four steps, if, especially if you kind of spin a ball and you have enough time. But basically it's one, two, three split step. Let's see here. Do you use a semi-Western grip? Yes. Uh, Jennifer Caporetti started the power game in women's tennis. Discuss. Um, uh, I would say no. I would say I would say Celis and Graf <laughs> started the started the power game. Uh, I mean, yeah, we we don't understand how hard Monica Celis hit the ball. Uh, let's see. Yo, let's discuss the McEnroe backhand. Meet everything on the up on the half volley. Meet everything on the up on the half volley. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, his technique, I mean, he had very long uh, contact points. He could hit the ball here, 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 and here, and the ball would still go in. It was very much through the ball. He's not really spinning the ball for top spin, which is fine. Is it possible to have power with an Eastern forehand grip? Is it possible to have power with an Eastern forehand grip? I would tell you that's when you're going to get the most power is when you're going to hit an Eastern forehand because there's the most amount of plowing through the ball. So as you go semi-Western and Western, it places... So when you hit an Eastern forehand, your palm is facing forward. When you hit a semi-Western forehand, your palm is up at 45 degrees. When you hit a Western forehand, your palm is facing up at 90 degrees. So as your palm goes up, your swing becomes more up because the contact point is farther out in front. So an Eastern contact point is here, semi-Western is here, full Western is out here. And that's just because your arm is a radius and you have to figure out how to get your strings to face forward when you strike the ball. So when you hit an Eastern forehand, you can contact here. When you hit a semi-Western, the contact's here. When you hit a full Western, the contact's out here. So you, since your arm's a radius, as you go farther in front, your hand is going more up and your racket's going more up. That's why you're going to get more spin on a full Western than you will typically, typically uh, on, a, on an Eastern. But that means you're going more into the back of the ball on an Eastern. So, I mean, that's typically when you're going to be able to absolutely pounce the ball. Uh, do you have any knowledge about scholarship tennis uh, in college? I have zero. I apologize. Uh, hello, when players, especially after I hit a drop shot from the forehand during a rally to disguise the opponent, do they switch to a continental grip? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you can make it so that you don't change the grip, that's what I, is ideal. I would say no, he's not changing to a continental. Um, what I'm noticing is he's kind of more on an Eastern. I think he changes it a little bit less. To be honest, um, like a continental grip is not the grip that pros use on a volley. Like, just so you know, like, pros do not use a continental grip on their volley. Um, they, like, the grip that they use on their serve, like a straight-up continental, if you told them to go to the net and now volley with that grip, they're not going to. They're going to shift it over slightly. Um, now, they use the same grip on their backhand. Um, so, like, when you watch pros volley, their knuckle is on the other side of three. They're not even on the corner between. They'll, they'll be slightly on the other side of three. Just look at, like, Nadal. Um, uh, so, but they don't use a grip change either. So like, I teach a grip change on volleys. I don't, I don't tell people to use the same grip. If they tell me, Hey, I've tried it and I like it better not changing my grip. Then I say, awesome. Um, yes. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. I, I try to do live streams. I do a lot of live streams on Instagram. Uh, volley with the grip needs to be ball lifted well, or else ball goes into the net. Um, I mean, I can, I can just go like that. I mean, that. Like that, that's all I need to do. Like that's it. And a low ball is the same thing. I don't use, I don't teach an Eastern grip either on, on that grip. What I teach is the knuckle on three and the heel pad on two and a half. How to get more bite, power speed on kick serves. Yeah, so one thing you can do is you can really work on getting the toss to go a little more forward into the court rather than the toss like landing on your head or landing on the baseline. See if you can have more of an arc. I was looking at Federer's serve. Uh, and on his second serve, it was a big kick serve from the ad side. He actually um, tossed farther forward into the court 
on his second serve, on his kick serve, than on the flat serve. So he was like way out. So here's the baseline. You can see the baseline on the ground. On his kick serve, he was way over, well, it's a really sh shallow ceiling, but like the ball's way over here. So don't just think of tossing above your head, but toss forward and behind your head. Um, and then the swing won't be so vertical and there'll be a little more of a forward movement into that shot. All right, we got 45 people. If you haven't hit the like button, it would mean the world to me if you did. My left forearm, hi, Helen. My left forearm is sore after playing. I'm right-handed with a two-handed backhand. Yes, I know. Uh, does this mean I'm hitting late or is that there are other problems to look, look for? Yeah. Um, if your left forearm is sore after playing, left forearm, um, it, it might be that you're very much squeezing hard. Um, so, Helen, if you are swinging on your forehand like this, if you're like pulling it back and then going forward too much and you don't have a looseness to the swing uh, and a continuation of the swing, then you're going to have to grip it and rip it. I just made a video, Helen, a couple days ago comparing uh, Buskova and uh, Radicanu on the two in a backhand. And Buskova went down, and that really wasn't the issue. She went down and then went forward again and then went back again, and then she swung. It was super inefficient. Uh, where you watch Radicanu, and it's just this continuous swing. What I would work on is, in, for the forearm soreness and tightness, what I would work on is really making sure you have a continuous swing, that your racket never slows down. That's what I would work on. I, I shouldn't say slows down, but it never pauses. All right, let's see here. How can I do better on my backhand racket drop? Oh, JH, great question. This is super, super technical. All right, so let's look at Djokovic's backhand. So the reason Djokovic is able to drop the way he does, so when you watch Djokovic, it's like this. It, it's this move. That is occurring because of racket, uh, I'm sorry, because of hip turn. So JH, here's what I want you to do. I want you to film yourself from the back, okay? I want you to film yourself from the back and I want you to look for one thing in particular. And here's that one thing. I want you to look for when your racket, I'm sorry, when your hips are rotating. So as we know on a two handed backhand, you've got to rotate. So the reason players struggle with their racket drop is because they wait, well, for many reasons, but maybe not many. There are a couple of reasons, and here's one of them. It's because they wait for the racket to drop down all the way. Then they begin turning their hips. When you look at Felix auger Seam, you look at Radicanu, you look at Joker, if their racket drops, let's say three feet, four feet, whatever, let's say four feet, so it's an even number. When the racket drops four feet, after the racket's dropped two feet, that's when their hips begin rotating. You have to begin rotating the hips as the racket is dropping. And here's what happens when you do that. The racket weighs something, right? Your racket weighs something. So if you haven't hit that like button, please do. It obviously helps the channel and helps me and my family, so thank you so much. When the racket is dropping, it has momentum, right? And the inertia, it just wants to keep going. So if you turn the hips, that pulls your hands forward. And when your hands get pulled forward as the racket's dropping, it breaks the wrist. So when you look at Joker, he has this dramatic like bounce right here. That He's not just throwing the racket down like this. As the racket's dropping, he's turning his hips. And that produces this, that the hand goes forward as the racket's trying to go down. So the wrist breaks. Now the racket's below the hand, and now he can make that move. So if any of you are looking for more power on your two-handed backhand, what I want you to practice is make sure that as the racket's dropping on the two-hander, you begin turning your hips. Most recreational players I work with, and I, I do a, a 10 to 12 Zoom private lessons just this morning, a couple hours ago, I was on the the uh, during a, I was on Zoom uh, from six to seven this morning with a, a college student in South Korea. So I teach people all around the world. I'm here in Philadelphia teaching people in South Korea. Crazy, right? And when I watch recreational players 
uh, all around the world hit two in a backhands, you watch their racket typically drops all the way down, then everything rotates together. And that is not gonna help a kinetic chain, it is definitely not gonna help power to accelerate through the shot. So racket all the way back, as the racket is halfway down to the bottom, which is like near your left leg, if, I'm sorry, your back leg, as the racket's dropping, begin turning the hips. That'll parlay the energy of the rotation. The rotation will, will actually pull the racket through. You can even see as I did that, there was a little bit of wrist break. Let me go like this. You can see that wrist break. And here I'm in, in extension and here's flexion and I'm making that move. And that's the way to actually get the racket drop. Players who wait until the racket drops all the way to the bottom, they don't have a racket drop or they don't have a very prominent racket drop. The racket doesn't get below their hand. You want the racket to go below your hand and that's gonna occur because your hip rotation, body rotation is gonna occur as the racket's dropping. Yeah, Mika, very good. She's great. Any tips to help with recovery after a match when you are getting older? Uh, no, but I would definitely say I, I'm, that is definitely not my, yeah, you got it, JH. That is definitely not my forte is like recovery and all this stuff. I just had donuts at a Starbucks <laughs> for breakfast this morning. As, so it's, it's not, my, not my thing. What I would say is this, the moment you're done with a match, if you're getting in your car and driving 20 minutes home, you are going to be hurting by the time you get home. So I would look up post match, that's a simple Google search, post match or YouTube search, post match recovery. When it comes to a cool down, whether it's gonna be something that you jump rope, whether it's you know just to cool down, maybe go for a walk, whether it's stretching, whatever it is, you have to make sure. This is something that Agassi didn't do. And you watch Agassi, I mean, he's not super old, but like, he walks like he is in, uh, dude, Alex, it's not good. It's, look, I'm, I literally have a, a, a Starbucks re strawberry lemonade refresher next to me as I'm, as I'm doing this live. Uh, da, 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 da. In the serve, how important is that your shoulders and the racket point at the beginning towards the box that I want to shoot? I see players who stand very rotated on the deuce side. Is that okay? Yeah, that's, I think that's completely over... Um, uh, overvalued. Like the, the main thing on the serve is that you rotate your body. That's the main thing. Uh, and guys, I'm going to be on here for another, probably another 15 minutes. Uh, but I am going to give you one, uh, I do have to give you one advertisement for something that I'm doing on my website. Uh, so I appreciate you. I've been on here for 32 minutes. If you can give me a minute and a half <clears throat> after I answer this question, uh, it would mean the world to me. So thank you so much. It'll be a nice trade, right? You get 40 minutes of me live answering questions and, and I'll take a minute and a half of your time to let you know of things I'm doing on my website. But when it comes to the serve, I, I don't necessarily think like, oh, the shoulders and the racket point to your target because you're going to be rotating every, anyway. If you've ever seen an aerial view of Sakari, her shoulders versus her hips, it's like an X on that serve. Um, JJ Wolf is the exact same thing. So I wouldn't necessarily focus so much on are my shoulders and my racket pointing toward my target. The main focus is that you are rotating. Now, when you rotate on the serve, it depends on the height of your toss when the rotation is going to occur. If you're someone who tosses very high, then you're gonna to wanna to toss and then rotate. If you're someone who has a lower toss, that's what I prefer, then you want to rotate and then toss. Someone who tosses high and then rotates, Felix Auger Aliassime. Someone who rotates and then tosses low, JJ Wolf. So that's what I would ask for. Uh, opinion on Michael Steak's serve, obviously, you know, Wimbledon champ, um, you know, back in the, the early 90s. I would have to look at his serve again. I'm 44, so that's right in my sweet spot. I was watching him and and all those guys. Uh, I loved Steak as a player. And uh, was he a serve and volleyer as well, if I remember? Um, I I thought of him as having very clean, classic strokes, but I would have to look at Steak's uh, uh, serve again to, to give you a, a real um, uh, kind of opinion on that. So, but I, I'm I'm intrigued now to go to go look at his uh, look go look at his serve. Let's go back. <clears throat> serving in a windy environment is very tricky. Yeah, so that's why you want to toss lower. In my opinion, you, you want to have lower tosses. Lower tosses are better than higher tosses. <clears throat> Do you have any advice to improve footwork? Yes. I'll give you, and I'll kind of relay this into what I was going to say. But the first thing is you have to make sure you split step. 
you have to make sure you split step. Look at that, we got 39 or 38 likes with 41 people here. Guys, really quick here. Um, so it's one thing to do a Zoom, uh, not a Zoom, a, um, a live stream here. It's one thing just to make a ton of YouTube content and try to make a lot of social media content, but it's another to have me personally work with you. Let me let you know of something that I do on my website. It's called the two minute tennis.net premium membership. Now I, I do Zoom private lessons all week long. <clears throat> this is where people all around the world send me videos maybe of their footwork, right? <clears throat> so we have somebody who wants to improve their footwork. So I do footwork lessons for people. So they film themselves playing matches and I watch their footwork from their split step to do they use a front foot pivot, a back foot pivot, a, a closed stance fallout? Uh, do they do a mogul? Do they know when to use an open stance versus a closed stance? Karaoke step on a, on a backhand slice going to the net. All these different things that they need to work on. I watch them, we meet live on Zoom, I share my screen, right? On Zoom, you share your screen. They can see what I see, I'm drawn on the screen, comparing their footwork to the pros. I give them a whole list in, of drills and ways to practice, they're awesome. You can do that, uh, it's $130 an hour. Or, I'm running a premium membership for my website, 2minutetennis.net. It's $40 a month. You can cancel any time. So don't let the fact that it's a sub subscription keep you from, from joining. It takes about six and a half seconds to cancel your membership. And right now, there are two ways to do this. You can do it month to month. You can do it year by year. Either way, you're going to get a free Zoom private lesson that comes with this. I would highly recommend that you go to 2minutetennis.net, get the, the premium membership for 40 bucks. And the moment you sign up for $40, you get a Zoom private lesson with me. I see you, you see me. You're at your house, I'm at my house. You send me videos of your serve, forehand, backhand. Your match play, I'll analyze an entire match and look at the points and the ways you could win more matches, get your opponent in trouble. Are you missing the split step? Da -da -da. Return of serve work, it's awesome. You also get a weekly live Zoom class with me. So this coming Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, is my premium member class, and we're going over simple ways to improve high balls at the net. When you get a high floating ball, some people, they shove an overhead into a situation when it should have been a swinging volley or a high volley. You know, do you hit down on the ball? Should you hit forward? You have to learn how to handle high balls that are floating up. That's actually this week's class. But if you pay 40 bucks, you're gonna get one Zoom, this is on my website, 2minutetennis.net. You, you can do it right now. $40, you're gonna get a Zoom private lesson with me, which is normally $130. You're gonna get half price Zoom private lessons in the future, like not just one, but you can buy as many as you want as a premium member and get them for half price. You get my mastery courses, dub, master your double strategy, uh, master your serve, master your forehand with more strategies or more classes coming because now it's nice and I can actually film outside because the winter's over. Uh, and you get these weekly group Zoom classes, which are amazing. It's a small group. I see you, you see me, you're demonstrating in your house. They are phenomenal. So I would love to help you personally, not just in a live where I'm kind of reading uh, what you're doing or asking questions. There's nothing like personalized instruction, and I would put my Zoom private lesson against any in-person lesson, and I'll even tell you this. If you take a Zoom private lesson with me, if you don't learn more in that one Zoom private lesson than you have in the last 10 in-person lessons that you will that you have taken, I mean this, I will gladly give you your $40 back. No one's ever asked for their money back, by the way, because the Zoom private lessons are so valuable when it comes to what you learn. You get a recording of them. The weekly classes, you get a recording of them. They are absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, is uh, Romania in $5 per hour pro player? Um, oh, to take a lesson, it's $5 an hour. Um, $5 uh, barely gets you a gallon of gas here. So it, I, I, I apologize. I, can't, I cannot do an hour lesson for $5. I would, uh, I would not be able to feed my family. My sister loves the premium membership. It's cheaper than one hour of indoor court time. Yep, Helen's uh, sister, Susan, is one of my premium members. That's how I know. I keep saying, oh, Helen, hello. I know Helen. Uh, more double strategy, please. Okay, let's do it. I'm actually working. I'm actually doing my very first live double strategy session later today with a club. So I'm gonna start working with tennis clubs to kind of pack the house in the lobby and they have a big big screen TV. I'm gonna do a live doubles uh, class today at six o'clock for a tennis club here in Pennsylvania. Um, 
And what's really cool is they're gonna pack the house for an hour. We're gonna go over 10 awesome double strategies and then they're all gonna go out in the courts and play. Now I'm not even gonna be there. I'm gonna be home. They're there at the club. You know, it's like an hour and a half away. Uh, so I, I, do, I do a lot of stuff, right? You gotta do a lot of stuff. All right, let's do double strategies. Let's talk simple, simple double strategies. The first thing is you gotta know where to stand. So I'll give you, I'll give you four great strategies. Four great strategies for those looking for double strategies. And by the way, for you, wanting to improve your single strategy and double strategy, record yourself playing a match. Put your phone or tablet or get a GoPro, get a, get a little hook for the fence that you can get for $20 off Amazon, film yourself playing a match, send me the footage, like upload it onto YouTube and make it a private video or unlisted. You gotta use YouTube that way as a, um, as a way to like just put videos up. Uh, make it private so no one can see it. Send me the footage, uh, that way you don't have to buy like you don't have to buy space like, you know, Dropbox space. You can just put it on YouTube and just make it private if you don't want anyone to see. Uh, and then I'll analyze the footage with you. And I've worked with so many teams uh, to get together and, and, and improve their strategy. But let's just talk about where to stand. So when you're serving, stand somewhat inside the singles line. So you can kind of be like by the singles line as much as five feet over, you know, what you feel comfortable with. When you're the server's partner, stand directly in the middle of the box. This is not what you see. People are usually too far back and too far over. Middle of the box. When you're the returner's partner, stand on the line, but not directly in the middle. Stand ever so slightly shaded toward the center tee. And obviously as the returner, this is all based on the serve. So if they have a really fast serve, stand farther back. If it's slow, da da da, you got the idea. All right, let's talk about where to hit the ball. If you wanna be right around 90% of the time, when it comes to where you aim your shots in doubles, simply hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you're standing. Of course, there are exceptions, but simply hit the ball to the opponent who's standing where you're standing and you'll be right nine out of 10 times. What does that mean? Most points are played one up, one back versus one up, one back, even though this isn't ideal. Uh, it'd be great if you could both play up and then you're both picking on this person. But let's just talk about reality. You've got to live in reality here, right? The players in the back, they should be trying to hit the ball to each other. If you're in the back, your job is to prolong the point. Your job isn't to end the point. Because if you're in the back and you end the point, the chances of winning are only 25%. If you're in the back and the shot you hit ends the point, you lost the point 75% of the time. You hit the net, you hit it out wide, whatever. It's very tough to hit a screaming winner from back by the baseline. So you need to kind of kick the can down the road and hit the ball to the other team's prolonger, the other team's person who's going to keep the point going. But let's say this is you and the baseliner hits the ball right to you. Now, I'm going to give you three choices. Should you, and then we're going to go, we're going to call it red, green, and blue. This is you. You have an overhead. Should you hit it for the red target? Should you hit it to the green target? Or should you hit it to the blue target? Now, uh, how to hit face volley, thanks. Uh, gotcha, that's a backhand. Uh, when the ball comes to your face, it's a backhand. Um, so this is your ball. Please just call out where you think you should aim your shot. You have an overhead. Keep going, keep going. We got one person who said red, I love it. Let's keep going. We got 33 people here. Red, red, red. <laughs> so like really red. Kimber, thanks so much. Let's keep going. Anybody else say green? Anybody? Anybody? Nobody else? I got 35 people and three answers. All right, no problem. All right, so here's the idea. Yes, the answer is red. We got some smart, smart players. Look, here's, it's one thing to know the information. Uh, we got green. It is red. So what we think of is, oh, we got to go to the center. The problem is when you aim to the center, this player goes over, easily gets it, and they put the ball back. It happens all the time. When you're at the net and you aim to the center, the baseliner goes and gets it because they're not stuck there. And by the way, they're going to predict that you're going to go to the green. They're going to predict that you're going to the green here, right? So they're going to start moving as you're even like about to hit the ball. They're going to move this way. So you wanna aim for the feet of the person closer to you. You aim for the feet of the person closer to you. So when you're at the net 
and you have a ball above net level, uh, green is rock, yeah. Uh, you are doing well, keep it up, I like it. <laughs> Thanks so much. When you have a ball here above net level, you pick on the shoes. You, what I tell my students is, I want you to untie, untie your opponent's shoes when you have a high ball. When you have a high ball, find the person closer to you and untie their shoes. Try to hit their laces and break their laces. That's kind of what you're doing. You're not trying to hurt anyone. You're aiming for their feet. You're probably not gonna hit their feet or hit them at all, but you're just trying to like not aim for their face. You don't wanna aim for their face. And you don't have to crush the ball very hard. You don't have to hit the ball hard because they don't have enough time to react. Uh, if you were playing dodgeball uh, in, in gym class, right? So think like you're 12 years old and you got the ball and you're trying to throw it at each other. And if you hit their body, they're out of the game. Who did you pick on? You didn't, you didn't throw the ball at the kid farthest from you. That would be ridiculous, right? You're probably all laughing like, yeah, that would be ridiculous. But that's what we do in tennis because we always hit overheads to the baseliner. The number one double strategy mistake is overheads and high volleys being hit to the baseliner because we think of it as, oh, here's the open court. But then this person has all the time. Singles is about hitting to open court. Doubles is about hitting to someone, but the right someone. And so when you're in the back, aim for the back. If you're up, aim for the up. You'll be right 90% of the time. You'll be wrong 10%. But if you're right 90% of the time, you're gonna, you're gonna dominate that match. All right, let's see if we can take one more question. And we'll see what we got here. I already answered, can I buy the premium membership for my nine-year-old son? I mean, do you teach juniors as well? Yes, I do a lot of junior coaching, yeah. In fact, what I do with the premium membership um, with the, the kids, so I'm teaching a seven-year-old kid right now in Australia. Um, I just ask that the parent be there, obviously, and sometimes the kid isn't even there. Um, so I just will teach the parent with the videos of the, of the student. So let's say you want to improve your son's forehand, backhand, and serve. Um, so just video from the side and from the back, forehand, backhand, and serve, meet one-on-one -on -one live. And with the pre if you get a Zoom private lesson with me, if you get a private lesson with me, it's $130 for the hour. Or you can get the premium membership and you get everything that comes with the membership plus a thrown-in Zoom private lesson so you can see what it's like. It's, it's awesome. And so I'll, I'll just teach you everything you need to teach your son. Uh, uh, so on a two-handed backhand, you're going to put the top hand as the hand that does the work. I naturally hit a really flat one-handed backhand by trying to incorporate more top spin. Consistency tips on how to do this. That's a great question, Agent. So this will be the last tip that I give for you, and it's how to get more top spin. And whether it's a two-hander or one-hander, it doesn't matter. Top spin is so much easier when you close your racket face, when you tilt your strings down. I have a handheld mirror here, handheld mirror. You have to think of the mirror pointing at the ground, not flat to the ground, but about 45 degrees, and then spin up the back of the ball. <clears throat> if you're someone who hits flat backhands typically, you're used to a racket where I could take the, uh, you know, the magnet that I was just using and place it on the throat. I'm oh, sorry, place it on the edge like this. And then you're used to hitting flat into the back. So when you try to hit spin, you're probably thinking that you have to do this in order to hit it. And that's because you're trying to manufacture the racket face that you need. What you wanna do is before you hit the ball, have your strings closed down and below the ball. So keep the racket up on the way back. And as you drop, keep both hands on the racket. Keep both hands on the racket to help assist the racket face closing. Now you can swing up the back of the ball. Tilt your strings down toward the ground and then spin up the back of the ball like that. That's how you're gonna get the ball to spin. Players typically are level to the ball and their racket straight up and down. That's why they can smack into the back. And then they try to spin the ball and it gets all over the place and their strings are facing all over the place and they can't control it. So get lower than the ball, turn high, drop below the ball, but tilt your strings down toward the ground, about 45 degrees. Then spin up the back of the ball and you'll get the spin that you want. Players, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate this. Look, I can only help you so much with these live, uh, these lives that I do. Yeah, you got it, agent. Happy to help. 
an agent, if you would like me to do a, a backhand analysis for you, go to twominutetennis.net. Yeah, you got it, Helen. Get the premium membership. Some of you have already heard about the premium membership from other people. Just go ahead and do it and get the membership because your level of play will absolutely improve. Um, and the premium membership comes with a weekly class with me just for premium members on Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you can't make the live class, no problem. I always put the recordings up on the website so members can go back and rewatch. You can watch classes that were back in January if you want. Uh, you get a free Zoom private lesson. If you do a yearly, so it's $40 a month, um, cancel any time, but if you do the yearly membership, it saves you two months. So it's $400 for the year and it comes with two Zoom private lessons. So you get 52 classes, group classes with me, plus two Zoom private lessons for 400 bucks. So you're getting the two Zoom private lessons for two, that normally 260. And for an extra 140, you're getting 52 live classes with me where I'm teaching footwork, strategy, showing you the pros. It's just absolutely awesome. You get my mastery courses too and half price lessons. Uh, that, you, you know, if you would like to purchase uh, Zoom lessons. So thank you all so much. I cannot wait to help you all. So go to twominutetennis.net to sign up. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always email me, ryan at twominutetennis.net, or just comment in this video, and I will be sure to answer. So thanks so much, and you got this.